I began this and I started talking about how that God created the heavens and the earth by his words. That's how powerful they are. There is creative power in words. And God spoke the worlds into existence. And we focused on that last night. This morning I was talking about how that not only did he create the heavens and the earth and us and everything that is tangible that we can see and touch. But God spoke all of these words here. We use scriptures out of Second Peter chapter 1. That holy man of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. First Thessalonians 2.13, Paul said, You receive the word, not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God that lives and abides forever. We use Hebrews 4.12, that the word of God is quick, that means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And in the same way as the word of God created the heavens and the earth, the word of God gave us this Bible. And all of these words in here are God breathed. All that we have to do is take the word and mix it with faith and something supernatural happens. Power is released, but it has to be mixed with faith. Another scripture that I've already used is Hebrews 4, 2, where it says the word of God was preached unto the Israelites that came out of Egypt, the same as it's been preached unto us. But the word preached unto them didn't profit them because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. And the problem is most of us do not put this kind of faith into the Word of God. We don't understand how powerful the spoken Word of God is, the written Word of God. Most people do not understand how powerful this is. We have people that come up to me all the time and they'll have a Bible under their arm and they say, Do you have a word for me? I need a word from God, and I just want to say there's millions of them right there. I've had people come up before and say, do you have a word concerning my healing? And I say, yeah, the Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus you were healed. They'll say, oh, I know that. But I was just wondering, do you have a specific word? Like, I've got cancer. Do you have a word from God? And I said, well, yeah, by his stripes you were healed. They say, no, I know that. But you know what they're saying without saying it is, that I don't honor God's Word, the written Word. I want something fresh. I want something new. Most people aren't satisfied with the written Word of God. And this is the reason that they aren't seeing the power of God manifest in their life, because they can hear, and it just doesn't mean anything. Our hearts have become hardened and insensitive to the Word. And I tell you, that is a serious problem. I've been talking about that. We've got to understand that these words were God breathed and it has the same creative power in it that created the sun. Think of how much power that is. Every word, every word of God, you can even go to the baguettes. You can get healed off of the baguettes. You can. You can get healed. It says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. All Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And brothers and sisters, I don't say these things to scold anybody. I'm saying it to open up our eyes. That we don't believe in the power of the Word that strongly, or if we did... We would spend more time studying this word, looking to find out what it says, to mix it with faith. If I was to follow most of you around, again, I'm not saying this to condemn. I'm saying it to open up our eyes that our actions belie what's really in our heart. They really reveal what's in our heart. If I was to follow most of you home, I guarantee you there's not a lot of people. And again, I'm preaching to the choir. This is what, Saturday This is a Saturday night. This isn't your nod to God crowd on Sunday morning. You're the fanatics. And yet if I followed most of you home, there would be precious little time spent studying the Word, praying, and taking these truths. If all of the things that I'm saying are true, if these words aren't just words on a page, but they're God-breathed, 
The same power that created the universe, that same power is right here in this Word. All you got to do is mix it with faith. If that's true, I guarantee you, we ought to all be in Bible school. Whether it's in a physical Bible school, but you ought to be in Bible school at home. You ought to be studying the Word. You ought to know the Word better than you know your name. We ought to know the Word of God better than we know anything. And yet, again, I'm not saying this to condemn, but I'm saying it to open up our eyes. Most of us know more about what's going on in our world, about your favorite football team, than you know about the Word of God. I'm, people come to me all the time and they say, well, you know, you just have a photographic memory. You can just quote Scripture and you know all of these kind of things. You can ask my wife. You can ask my staff. I don't have a photo. Well, it is, uh, it's scary what I can forget. It really is. I do not have a photographic memory. But you know what? Whatever you set your heart upon, you can remember. And if you're saying, well, I just don't have a photographic memory. I can't remember. I know that the Bible says someplace I forget. If it's old or new cut, I forget, but, you know, somewhere by his stripes we were healed, but I'm not sure exactly where that is. And you blame it on the fact that you just don't have a photographic memory, and yet you can tell me everything about your favorite football team. You can talk about these people. You know these names. You know the scores. You know all of these things. You know what? You can remember what you set your heart on, and the truth is most of us have set our heart on the things of this world. Most of you can tell me more about all the entertainers in the movies than you know about the Word of God, because that's where your heart is. It's all into pleasure and getting your needs satisfied. I'm not saying this to hurt you, but I'm saying our actions show what we really are focused on and what's really important to us. You can remember the things that are really important. You know, we played Trivial Pursuit. We used to when Jamie's parents were alive. And uh, I just missed out on nearly 40 years worth of history and of our culture. Because I've had my nose in the Bible studying the Word. And I just honestly don't know very much about things. When It's funny. We, we were on, on a cruise. Our staff sent us on a cruise. And it was a wonderful cruise. It was great. But you know what? I was out of place because we had to eat with people that you didn't know. And you had to make conversation. And I don't know anything but the Bible. They would go to talking about books. Like one night they said, all right, let's go around the table and everybody tell what your favorite drink is. Everybody was talking about a Harvey Wall banger and about whatever else. And they got to me and I said, I've never taken a drink of liquor in my life. I'm sorry. I don't know. And they just, you know, that was the end of the conversation. We finished the meal. Nobody said anything. I just honestly don't know much about anything outside of the Bible. We would play Trivial Pursuit and I'd sit there hour after hour and think, I don't know what this is. I'd have to depend on my father-in-law and my brother-in-law to answer the guy's questions because I didn't know. I don't know sports. And I just determined, I said, I'm going to get this next one. I said, Father, give me a word of knowledge. And I was believing God to just give me a supernatural revelation about the answer. And so this question came up about what magazine debuted April the 1st, 1953. <laughs> Nobody had a clue what it was. And God gave me a word of knowledge. It was Playboy magazine. And it was right. So the only question I answered all night long was when Playboy magazine came out and they said, You've been you've been doing something more than what you've let on, but honestly it was a word of knowledge, amen. That's how I got it. I tell you what, I have to have a word of knowledge to function like most people do. I just don't know a lot. But, you know what, I know the Word of God. I don't know it all, but I know a lot about the Word of God. And I'm saying that if the things I'm saying are true, this is the way that it should be. We should, the Scripture says in Romans chapter 16, I believe it's verse 19, that I would have you to be wise concerning that which is good and simple. 
concerning that which is evil. The word simple there, literally, is it's the word that we get simpleton from. It's like saying that you should be retarded. You should be ignorant concerning the things of this world. And sad to say, most of us know a lot about this world. We know all of the things that are going on, but we don't know the Word of God. We need to reverse this. We need to get to where you know the Word of God. If this is truly creative power, if these words are God-breathed, and if they carry the same power as the power that created the sun, the moon, and the stars... And if we have that much power right here in our hands and all we have to do is mix it with faith, then man, you ought to know the Word of God. You ought to know it so well that you don't have to say it says in there somewhere. I heard a preacher one time say that he'd rather leave home without his pants than without the Bible. Without his trousers. Over here, I think pants are different. (laughs) He'd rather leave home without his trousers than to leave home without the Bible, because if he had the Bible, he could get another pair of trousers. And you know, on the surface, that sounds good, but I got thinking about it, that if you had to have your Bible to say, let's see, I think it's somewhere over here, uh, is it Philippians 4, 13, somewhere it says, my God shall supply all of your needs. If you had to have your Bible and look it up, if it wasn't already in your heart, you aren't going to get it standing on the street corner trying to believe for your trousers. It needs to already be in your heart. You don't need to just carry it under your arm. It needs to be in your heart so that you can quote it, so that you know where it is, so that it's a part of you. You know, when I first started believing God, one of the first things I started doing was believing for healing. And I had never been sick very much in my life. I've been relatively healthy. But the moment I started believing in healing and preaching healing, I got sick and stayed sick for nearly six months. I had a cold, I had a headache, I had the flu, I had a runny nose. I'd be teaching the Bible, having Bible studies and saying, by the stripes of Jesus, we are healed. And I'd have to stop and blow my nose. And I started to quit and give up, thinking, well, it's not working. And finally, I just came to the point that this is what the Word of God says. And whether I can live it or not, I'll preach it because I believe it, whether it's working in my life or not. When I made that decision, I turned the corner. But I still had some sickness come at me for a while. And I remember right after Janie and I got married that I was so sick with the flu one night. I was hurting so badly that I couldn't stand up. I hurt too bad to stand up. But I wasn't just going to go to bed and lay in bed and take something for it and act sick. I had learned about the power of action. Faith without works is dead. So I was trying to act healed. I wasn't going to just lay in bed and act sick. And yet I was too sick to stand up. And so what I did, we had a wood floor and I got on the floor on my hands and knees because if I laid down, I was so sleepy, I'd go to sleep. So I got on my hands and knees so that I could stay awake, but I couldn't stand up. And I took the Bible and I started quoting scriptures. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, by his stripes we are healed. Matthew 8, 16. This was the fulfillment of that scripture by Isaiah, that he himself bore our infirmities and carried our sicknesses. 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes we were healed. It put into the past tense. 3 John chapter 1, verse 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And on and on. And I just started believing these scriptures. And I was fighting going to sleep and fighting the pain. And for eight hours... I was on my hands and knees quoting these verses and pushing to keep myself from going to sleep. I would push the Bible with my nose and crawl around in a circle. And I did that for eight hours, quoting scriptures and praise God. I got healed after eight hours. And some of you think that's a little extreme. You don't have to do it the way I did, but you've got to have that attitude. And I can promise you this. If you spend eight hours up fighting your sickness and fighting your pain and pushing the Bible around with your nose, you'll never have to say, now, uh, was that the old covenant or the new covenant that it says, by his stripes we were hit? Where is, uh, is that the way it goes? You, you know what? You fight like that and you live like that and I guarantee you, you'll know where the scripture is. The reason people don't know where the Scripture is and what it says is because you haven't focused on it, you haven't fought. You fight 
and you put your life on the line, and I guarantee you, you're going to know where that Scripture is. It'll become a part of you, and you won't have to say, uh, ask somebody where the Scripture is. Thank you for that thunderous silence. I'm not saying any of this to condemn anybody. I'm saying it to, re- to help you realize that we say, oh yeah, the Word's important. I believe the Word of God. Our actions prove that we don't understand how powerful these words are. Or if we did, we'd treat them differently. You'd know what the Word of God says. You wouldn't trust me to tell you what the Word of God says. You'd get your own copy. You'd study it. You'd get your own revelation of this. I'm telling you that the Word of God is powerful, and we need to put faith in the words that God has given. The same God that created the universe gave us this Bible, and it will produce whatever it is that you need if you'll mix it with faith. Look in Matthew chapter 8, and let me share a story with you about the centurion and his servant who got healed. In Matthew chapter 8, and in verse 5, it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, There came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. You know, the palsy, these words are different than what we use today. We don't know exactly, but it was some kind of paralysis. That's what a palsy is. And uh, we don't know all that that meant, but he was somehow or another paralyzed, immobile, incapable, of moving, And in verse 7 it says, And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goes. And to another, Come, and he comes. And to this Servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This man was a centurion. That means he was a Roman. He was not a Jew. And Jesus was saying to the religious crowd, to the Jews that thought that they had a corner on God, And that they were closer to God than anybody else. And for anybody to even have a relationship with God, they had to become a Jew first. That's the way that people believed. And he was saying to all of the Jews that followed him, I have never found so great a faith, not in all of Israel. That would be like us saying today that I have never found in the church a person who has this great a faith. That would be very offensive to the religious people. But this is what Jesus was saying. I've never found so great a faith. In verse 11, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of Israel. Talking about Gentiles, people who are non-church people, non-religious, the people that most of religion today would reject. He says all of these non-religious people, The people who don't dress the way that you say that you've got to dress. They don't talk the way that you think that you have to talk. There's going to be all of these non-religious people come and they will enter into the kingdom and sit there. And in the next verse it says, But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He's just saying that many non-religious people have a better relationship with God than many religious people. Thank you for that one head nod that I saw. I know that this is startling to people, but this is Jesus saying this. And then he said in verse 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, Go your way, as you have believed, so be it done unto you. And his servant was healed in the self-same hour, in that exact hour. What is it that made Jesus marvel at this man's faith? There's only two times in the New Testament that Jesus marveled. Once is right here at this man's great faith. I've never seen this great a faith. And the other time he marveled, it says he marveled at his disciples' unbelief. He marveled that people could disbelieve, has so much unbelief in them. He marveled that people could be so dull and non-perceptive to him. And he marveled that a non-Jew, a person who didn't even have... The covenant relationship with God could be so strong in faith. 
What made him marvel at this man's faith? I suggest unto you that it was the fact that he says, you speak the word only. I understand the power and the authority of words. He was a soldier. And if he told a man, he says, go. If they didn't go, you could put that person to death. You know, I don't know how many of you have been in the military, and the military has changed a lot. Even when I went into the military, I was drafted when I was 18 years old, and I went to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, I mean, going through our training, it was tough. There was people in my training who were killed during our training. It was bad. And I asked one of our drill sergeants, I said, why are you so mean? Why do you do these things to people? Because, I mean, it was mean. Today, I don't think you could get by with it. In the United States, uh, drill sergeants, the military, they'd sue them for doing the things that they used to do. But, I mean, they used to do bad things. They would kick us, beat us, do things to us, harass us. And, I mean, it was bad. There's just no way. It, it was bad. Hey, Amen. Did I say that? It was really bad. They treated us like we actually rode in cattle trucks that they hauled cattle in. They would put 200 of us in a cattle truck. No, nothing to sit on. You'd just stay in there and they'd haul us from place to place like cattle. We would move lots of times when we were being transported. And I asked this drill sergeant, I said, why do you do these things to us? Why do you treat people? You just harass people. You do things that are unnecessary. And this drill sergeant told me, he says, most of you are mama's boys. I was 18 years old. There were 17 and 16-year-old kids that had been drafted and put in the army. And he said, we're going to send you into battle. And he says, if we don't toughen you up and get you to where you're tough, you're going to be the very first ones killed over there says, we got to get you hardened and toughened up. And so because of it, they were rough on us. And there was two people in my group of 200 people. Well, that's 1% of the people actually died during our training. But you know what? Because of that, probably a larger percentage of people lived once we got into Vietnam and they were able to endure the things that were going on because of the training that we took. But they were just mean and they did all of these things. Why did I get off on that? Oh, I was talking about the military. They teach you that you know what? You don't sit there and just reason it out and you don't take a vote. One of the things that this guy told me, he says, we've got to get you to where you just obey commands without sitting here second guessing and trying to figure out why we do it. Because the lieutenant is going to get information over the phone, and he hasn't got time to go to 200 people and explain why he's telling you to do something. He hasn't got time for everybody to take a vote and say, do we want to charge this hill? Do we want to follow this order? Should we do it or should we not do it? He hasn't got time to explain it to everybody. He may have information that if you don't move right now, you're fixing to be attacked by an enemy, and he hasn't got time to go around and explain it. We've got to get you to where you just hear and you obey. You take commands and you obey them. And he says, we're trying to get you to where you quit reasoning and you just sit here and do what you're told. And you know what? There's not very many people that put that kind of an importance on words. But the military, I don't know how it is today, but that's the way it used to be that you just were, you, you respected authority. And if they told you to do something... If they charge, told you to charge this hill where you were possibly going to be killed, it was because it was the best thing to do, even if your life was on the line. And you had to get to where you obey and follow instructions. There's not very many people today that would just follow instructions like that. We've become too independent. We all have our own opinion. We're all going to sit here and say, well, what makes that guy any better than me? And people just don't put that kind of an importance on words. This is what this military man was saying. He says, I'm a man under authority. I know how it works. I tell somebody, go, and if he doesn't go, I kill him. I tell them, come, and if they don't come, I kill them. People do what I tell them to do. And he understood the power in words. He understood that he could just say, Something and a person had to do it or they would be killed as a result. He understood the power of words. And he says, I don't need you to come into my house. I don't have to see you wave your hand over the place. 
I don't have to hear your voice. I don't have to do anything. You just give a command. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed because I'm a man under authority. I know how it works. I know the power of words. And this is what made Jesus marvel and say, I have never seen such great faith. A man, because he understood the power of Jesus' words. And Jesus commended him and said, this is the greatest faith I've ever seen. Look over in John chapter 20 and let's contrast this with one of Jesus' own disciples. This is after Jesus was risen from the dead. And after he rose from the dead, he appeared unto his disciples, but Thomas, one of his twelve disciples, wasn't present. And they told Thomas about, we've seen the Lord. And he spoke to him. They had all the doors and the windows locked, and Jesus just showed up inside of the room. He just appeared, and they talked to him. And so they told Thomas about this. But look at this in John chapter 20 and verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. And put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. I will not believe. Brothers and sisters, let me just make a proclamation to you. You may think, oh, I want to believe. I'm trying to believe, but it's hard to believe. No, you will to not believe. Thomas said, I will not believe. It was his choice. And if you're struggling with unbelief, it's because you have accepted other people's opinion, you have bought into the mindset of this world, you have hardened your heart to God by neglecting the things of God, and you have chosen to be where you are. Many people don't like that. We like to blame other people and say, you don't understand, it's my upbringing that made me this way. You don't understand, I was abused when I was a child, and that's what made my heart hard. We have all of these excuses, and we like to blame other people. Even Adam did it. When God said, what have you done? He says, it's that woman that you gave me. He passed a buck to Eve and then he tried to blame it on God. We love to blame other people for our hard heart. But the truth is, every one of us in here has a choice whether we become bitter or better. You have a choice whether you let your background trap you and put you in prison and hold you in hurt, or you can turn and say, I'm not going to let this thing defeat me. If that wasn't true, our world, again, most of us are more influenced by the world than we should, and our world is becoming increasingly ungodly, increasingly secular, and with technology, we now are able to do things that previous generations weren't able to do. And there is an attitude among people that they're trying to find a physical, natural reason for everything. They say now that alcoholism isn't your fault. you got a gene that makes you genetically disposed to be an alcoholic. I've heard that there are genes that make you genetically disposed to be overweight. There are genes that make you depressed and discouraged. And we've got an excuse for everything. But that is not true. You can take people who came out of the exact same family, who are identical twins, have the same gene pool, are raised in an alcoholic family, raised in an abusive family, both sexually abused or whatever. You can take identical people identical environment, and they'll go different directions because we've got a choice. You are not an animal that is just a product of your environment. You can choose to be bitter or better. If that wasn't true, then the Lord would be unjust. If that wasn't true, the Lord would be unjust to hold you accountable for your actions if you were made to be the jerk that you are. You may have had things happen to you, but you chose to accept it. You chose to do it. Satan cannot oppress you, do anything to you without your consent and cooperation. You have to accept the fact that somehow or another you are a piece of trash, that you aren't worth anything. I don't care what anybody tells you. You have to accept that or you can reject it. 
You have people brought up into their identical situations and they just choose to say that's not true. I reject it and they go the other direction and there are people that prosper. We have people today that say that because of the color of your skin, you just carry a chip on your shoulder that you can't succeed and you go around and you, you use that as an excuse for everything. And yet there are people the same color that you are that have totally succeeded and have overcome all barriers and all problems. You can't use the color of your skin, your lack of your education, whether you're a male or a female. You need to quit blaming other people and you need to recognize that if you're in unbelief, if you aren't prospering in some area, it's because you chose it. You might have been pressured to choose it. You may have had problems that other people didn't have, but ultimately you chose. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 19 says, Behold, this is God speaking. He says, Behold, I call heaven and earth. That means that this applies in heaven or in earth. Over all of the earth, over any place in the universe in heaven, this is a truism. I call heaven and earth to record against you this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. God gave you the choice. Nobody can force you to do anything. Nobody can force you to fail. The devil can't force you to be sick. Some of you are saying, now brother, I didn't do a thing to make this sickness come on me. Yeah, you did. You may not have gone out and sinned to make yourself sick. You may not have gone out and said, I want to be sick. I pray for sickness. But you accepted The lie of this world that you're only human, that you don't have any power, that you can't sit here and speak the word of God and walk in divine health. You chose to not believe Psalms chapter 91 that says no plague will come nigh my dwelling. You chose to not believe that. You chose to believe that you can't live that way. You did choose. You made wrong choices. You have chosen to be just like everybody else, and you're only human. Wendell mentioned that song the other day, yesterday, or this morning, or whenever. But you know what? It's not true. I am not only human. One third of me is wall to wall Holy Ghost. I have been born again, and I've got the same power on the inside of me that raised Christ from the dead. And I've got promises that no plague will come nigh my dwelling. That I will not be sick. He has redeemed me from all sickness. And you can walk in supernatural health. Some of you are sitting there saying, I don't believe that. You choose not to believe it. I'm telling you what the Word of God says. And if you choose not to believe that, and if you say, I just don't believe that you can live that way. I believe everybody's got to be sick. I believe that there's a flu season and everybody has to get sick. I believe that there's a recession going on. I can't operate in prosperity. There's a recession going on. After all, I'm only human. The Bible says, my God, Philippians 4:19, shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not according to the British pound, not according to the U.S. dollar. It doesn't matter what goes on in the world. God said he'd supply our need according to his riches in glory. If you don't believe that, you chose to not believe what the word of God says. You may not have chosen poverty, but you chose to believe that you can't operate in what the Word says, and that made you susceptible to the same problems that everybody else goes through. But we've got these promises from God's Word. You can choose to believe. Thomas said, I will not believe. And some of you think, oh, I don't want to be this way. I'm trying to believe. I just don't know how. You chose to be the way that you are. You were taught to think a certain way, and you have embraced it, and you will not let go of it. You're holding on to your own thinking. You've got the thing that will change your thinking. The Word of God will transform your thinking. The Word of God is given to make you brand new. It says over in Second Peter chapter 1 that grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of Him. That's the Word. And then the next verse says, according as His divine power hath given unto us, All things. In the Greek, that word for all there means all. It means God's word has given unto us all things. That includes healing, prosperity, joy, peace, anything you need. All things have been given unto us through the knowledge 
of him that is called us to glory and virtue. And then verse 4 says, And through this knowledge was given unto us these exceeding great and precious promises. The word of God is the knowledge of God. It's the exceeding great and precious promises. And everything you need is in here. You can renew your mind through studying this. If you read the word of God day and night, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Notice, it's not just thinking it, you need to talk it. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you might observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, when you meditate in the book of the law day and night, then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. There's lots of people in here that want prosperity. You want success. You want to, you don't want to just live your life and die and be gone and nobody miss you. You want to make a difference. You want to feel like you're significant and that you're touching somebody's life and that, that the world is better off because you're here. You desire that and you pray for it. But the Bible says that that happens when you meditate in the book of the law day and night. Then you make your way prosperous and then you have good success. If that's true, why don't we do that? If that's true, you just meditate in it. And I've got a tape set back there entitled Effortless Change. You will change effortlessly. You will change without even thinking about it. You don't have to pray and beg and bawl and squall and fast and get your prayer chain to agree with you that God will do something. If you meditate in the Word day and night, the Word of God will just change you because it is the supernatural power of God. And all you got to do is get it. you got to get the knowledge of it first, meditate on it, mix it with faith, and something supernatural happens. And things happen. You get healed. You get delivered. You walk in divine health. I got off on all of this by saying, Thomas said, I will not believe. And some of us feel like, well, it's not my will to not believe. Yes, it is. You chose to believe what you believe. Nobody made you believe anything. You may have been taught to believe one thing. I was taught to believe different than what I believe. And yet I chose to change. And it took a lot of effort. Like I said, I had to get on the floor and push the Bible around with my nose to say, no, in the name of Jesus, I can have what I say. I am healed and I am not sick. And there's a lot of you that just won't go to that much effort. There's people that have come to this meeting and you want me to pray over you and wave my hand. And if you get healed, well, hallelujah, I believe it. But if it doesn't happen, you walk out or ask kind of what I expected. I didn't really think anything was going to happen. That's about all the effort that a lot of people put into it. You chose to think the way you are. It was your choice. Other people may have encouraged it. It may be the way that other people think. But we've got a different way of thinking. We've got a different set of values. We've got the Word of God. And there is not an excuse for any person in here to be ignorant of the Word of God. I suspect every one of you can read. I suspect every one of you have a Bible. You probably have multiple Bibles. There is not an excuse for us to be ignorant of the Word of God and living the way that we do and acting so pathetic and so like we have no power or no authority. I have people come to me all the time and they just are, they're trying to make it as pitiful as they possibly can. So I'll have pity on them. And, and they just tell me and they break up and they even cry. And I just have no power, nothing. So would you please pray for me? Would you agree with me? And I tell them, no, I won't agree with you. Why would I accept your attitude? You're saying that you have no power. I'm not going to agree with you or nothing's going to happen. I can't agree with you. I tell people all the time, man, don't act like you have no power, no authority. God's the one. He gave you power and authority. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You need to stir yourself up. I told a person this afternoon, I said, man, you ought to get angry at the devil. Don't you ever let this stuff back in you again. And when I talk that way, most people just look at me like, I didn't do this. I didn't let this in. And they don't understand that your passive attitude, you sitting there thinking, well, I'm only human and I'm just a person. What can I do about it? That is 
an inroad of Satan into your life. You need to get an attitude that, praise God, you're angry at the devil. You don't let the devil run over you. God gave you power. The Bible says you resist the devil and he will flee from you. James chapter 4, verse 7. If Satan hadn't fled, it's because you haven't resisted. Somebody said, oh, no, I pray all of the time. I beg and plead with God. That's not resisting. The word resist means to actively fight against. You need to get angry. God gave you the capacity for anger. Every person in here has a temper. You know why? Because God gave it to you. But he never intended for you to use it against people. You aren't fighting flesh and blood. You shouldn't be angry at people. You shouldn't say things to people. What you need to do is get angry at sickness. You need to get angry at the devil. How dare you touch my body? How dare this come against me? Satan, I dare you in the name of Jesus. You will not win over me. You need to take this anger and you need to get angry at the devil. I was preaching this in a church one time and the pastor stopped me and said, Brother, we don't even get angry at the devil around here. And I said, that's the problem right there. Amen. The Bible says that you're supposed to abhor that which is evil. That means hate evil. Evil isn't only sin. Homosexuality, lying, stealing, adultery, murder, theft. Sin is sickness and disease. That all came as a result of sin. It doesn't mean that you're a sinner or a bad person if you're sick, but it means it's a result of sin. It was not what God created us to be. You need to hate sickness. As long as you can put up with being sick, you will be. But when you get to where I refuse this, I fight this, I'm angry at this, yell at it. You know, we had Deborah give her testimony this morning, and she was talking about how she would stand and yell against those thoughts and refuse to accept the fact that her children were autistic. And yet the world will come against you and tell you that you're absolutely stupid. Embrace it. This is just the way it is. You're going to have to live a life of coping. No, you need to get to where you refuse autism, where you refuse all of these things and say, I will not live this way. This is not the way my life is going to be. I know many of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. I'm telling you, this is how you're supposed to live. When Thomas said, I will not believe, that was a choice of his will. He chose to believe that Jesus could not be raised from the dead. He saw Jesus crucified. He saw what happened and he said, I will not believe anything I can't see. And so it goes on to say, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. And look at this, verse 27. Then said, saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger. And behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Jesus wasn't there when Thomas said this. He hadn't appeared to any of the disciples since Thomas had said this. So for Jesus to say this to Thomas showed that truly he was God. He knew all things. He wasn't present. He hadn't talked to anybody who was present. And yet he knew everything that Thomas had said. And he said, stick your finger into the print of the nails. Put your hand into my side where the pier spear pierced me. And don't be faithless but believing. He would be unjust to command that if Thomas couldn't change. Again, most of us, we have just embraced the fact that we're weaklings, that we don't have this. We have embraced the ungodliness of this world where they think we're just an evolved animal. You were made in the image of God. You can believe. There's a part of you that is full of faith, that has the ability to believe. The Lord didn't tell him to do something that was impossible. He says, don't be faithless. Believe. Some people think, well, I'd just be a hypocrite if I started talking like I believe because the truth is I still have doubts. You know what? We'll always have doubts. Every time I speak the Word of God to somebody, I have the possibility to doubt. I have thoughts that go contrary, but I choose to reject that negative, and I stand on what the Word of God says, and I choose to believe. If you're looking for a time, 
that you'll never have a reservation, that you'll never have a doubt, that you'll just believe it and there is zero opportunity to doubt, then you aren't going to get that until you die and go to be with the Lord and your mind is renewed. There's always going to be something that you could believe that if you wanted to, but I choose to believe. I choose to stand on the Word of God. I speak what I believe. And people say, but I'd be a hypocrite if I do that. It just depends on what you believe is the real you. Do you think this carnal mind and all of your messed up thinking is the real you? The truth is, if you've been born again, there's a new you on the inside that is perfect. That has the mind of Christ in it. 1 Corinthians 2.16, Colossians 3.10. You've been renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created you. That's not talking about your little peanut brain up here. It's talking about in your spirit. And First John chapter 2, verse 20, you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Most people think, well, I don't know all things. I can prove it to you. I was looking for my glasses and they were on my head and I couldn't find them. You don't know all things with your little peanut brain, but in your spirit you have the mind of Christ. You know all things. So it just depends on which you believe is the real you. Do you think the part of you that doubts is the real you? I'm telling you, that's the part of you that caused Jesus to have to come to this earth and die. But when you got born again, there's a new you on the inside that is righteous and holy and pure. And you have the mind of Christ and you know all things. And it just depends on which you believe is the real you. If you think you've been born again and that you are what God's word says that you are, then you are a hypocrite to indulge your doubts. If you feel like you're a hypocrite to speak the word, that's because you consider the real you to be the physical, emotional you, not the spiritual you. You need to find out who you are in Christ. You need to change identities and find out who you are. The Lord told him not to be faithless, but believing. And look at this. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. When Thomas saw Jesus and he looked and he saw the print in his hands. And he saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. He fell on his face and said, My Lord and my God. And look at Jesus' answer. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The Lord said there is a greater blessing on the people who will believe the word without having to have a physical proof or evidence. But you believe the word. He says you believe because you saw, but yea, rather blessed are those who believe without seeing. You know, I was raised in the Baptist church. I was told that all miracles passed away with the apostles. You could be born again. In this day, but you couldn't have miracles and there wasn't supernatural things and God didn't speak to people and things like this. And when I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit just started showing me that all that was not true and that God still is doing miracles. And I started believing for miracles. I started listening to people who talked about that they heard God in an audible voice. They saw visions. They dreamed dreams. And when I found out that all this stuff was true and that I'd been missing out on this my entire life, man, I got to seeking God. I wanted to see Him. I wanted a vision. I wanted a dream. I was praying that I could hear voices, that I could do all of these things. And I mean, I was fasting and praying and trying to put pressure on God that He would manifest Himself in some visible, tangible way. And that's when the Lord showed me the difference between the centurion's faith and Thomas's faith. And he said, Andrew, he says, I can speak to you in an audible voice. I can show myself to you visible. I can do all kinds of things. God has done that. He still does it today. He says, if you pressure me, you can get those things. But then he showed me this and he said, yea, rather... There is a greater blessing on you if you would just take my word and believe it. You can operate in a greater anointing. if you. The greatest faith is the faith that says, speak the word only. God, I see it in the word. That's sufficient. I don't have to have 
two cats walked this way and one dog walked that way to confirm to me that this was your word. I don't have to have somebody call out my name and prophesy over me. God, you show me in the Word of God, and I'm going to believe it. And I made that decision. And you know, to this day, I've never seen anything visible. I've never heard an audible voice from God. I've never had any of the physical manifestations that other people have. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying that there's something wrong. But I just chose. And I said, God, I want to operate in your highest faith. I want to operate in the greatest degree of faith. And if just trusting your Word is better. If you would rather me do that, then that's what I want to do. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith pleases God. And God will meet you where you are. There may be some of you that, you know, have seen things and heard things, and there's nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make you inferior. Some of the great men and women of God have seen things. But I'm saying, based on these scriptures, the greatest way of walking in faith. The thing that pleases God the most is when you take the Word and believe it without having to see, without having to have something proven to you. Most people only use the Bible as like a stepping stone to something. They will sit there and pray and read the Bible and quote scriptures hoping to have an encounter with God. And then the moment they have a visible thing, the moment something supernatural happens, they'll throw the Bible down because they were only using it as a means to the end of having something with the Lord. But I'm telling you that you need to take the Word of God and get to where you believe it. And if there's a visible manifestation that comes, then it ought to be like Jesus in the 12th chapter of the book of John. He cried out and he said, Oh God! Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. And an audible voice out of heaven came and said, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. And Jesus turned around. And the Scripture says that the people heard it. Some of them said it was the voice of an angel. Other people said it thundered. They heard the audible voice of God and people were able to explain it away and say it's thunder. You know what? If you don't have a heart to believe, it doesn't matter. If you heard an audible voice from God, you'd be able to explain it away somehow or another. And Jesus turned around and says, this voice didn't come for my sake. In other words, he didn't have to have Jesus, God the Father, speak to him in an audible voice. He had faith. He knew the word of God. But he said, this voice came for your sake so that you might believe. Once you get on the Word of God and once you start taking this Word and believing the Word and operating in this highest form of faith, you can reach a place that if you do hear an audible voice, if you do see the visible thing, you don't throw the Word away and now start going with these things. You stick with the Word. The Word is what produced all these other things and you just stay with the Word. We've heard these testimonies. We've had great testimonies of miracles, autism being healed. Blind eyes being opened, deaf ears being opened, miracles have happened in just the last day or two. God's doing awesome things, but I didn't use the Word just so that I can see a miracle. And now that I've got the miracle, I throw this aside and start saying, I know God is real because I saw this happen and I saw this person happen. No, I'm staying with the Word. The Word is what produced these other visible things. And praise God for them. I rejoice when I see And feel the presence of God. But I'm going to stand on the Word of God. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care what I feel like. I don't care if the doctor does confirm. There's people that come and want prayer. And I'll pray for them. And they say, praise God. I'm going to go to the doctor and see if I was healed. Wrong. You need to believe that the Word of God says you're healed. And that's it. Period. Now, if you want to go to a doctor... If you want to get it a confirmation so you can bless other people, but it ought to be for other people. You ought to have the word of God that I am healed by his stripes. And I don't care what my body feels like. I don't care what a test feels like. I don't care what anybody has to say. This is what God's word says, and I believe it. And I know that there are many of you that think that's absolutely irresponsible. You'd never do that. You chose to believe that way. You have been molded by our society to believe that you're absolutely stupid, silly, foolish to believe in something that you can't see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. Something that you can't prove and attest to. 
But I'm telling you that the Word of God, just believing it, and you don't have to have the Lord come and wave His hand over it. You don't have to have Him enter into your house. You don't have to have somebody touch you. You don't have to have something physical, natural happen, but you just get a Word from God. And you believe it, that is the greatest form of faith. And that's what God is looking for. And this is what I've been sharing all of this week, is trying to tell you the power of faith-filled words, specifically God's words. He never alters it. He never changes it. It's a covenant. The power that created this universe also created this Bible. This Bible is as powerful as the force that created the universe. But it's got to be taken off of this page and put in your heart and mixed with faith. It doesn't have any power until you get it off of this page. I can take the pages in this Bible and shred this Bible and throw it in a hundred different directions. And some people will say, how dare you desecrate the Word of God? This is a perfect representation of the Word of God. I believe down to the last jot uh, and tittle, the last dotting of an I or crossing of a T. But it is not the Word of God. This paper and the ink on this paper is not the Word of God. The true Word of God is a living thing. It's alive. It's powerful. And it only is the Word of God once it gets on the inside of you and mixes with your faith and becomes a part of you. You cannot hurt the Word. I've known so many people that reverence the Bible. I was at a woman's house and I set a, a cup of tea on top of the family Bible. And she, you just you nearly sucked all of the air out of the room. <laughs> and I moved the saucer real quick and you could see the ring that it left on the Bible, the dust. She honored the Bible, but she didn't read it. That's not honoring the Word. This isn't the Bible until it comes alive on the inside of you. The true Word of God is Spirit. Jesus said in John six sixty three, The words that I speak unto you, they are Spirit. And they are life. This is spiritual. And until you get it on the inside of you mixed with faith, it is not the Word. This is a perfect representation of the Word. You can quote it. You can speak it. You can pray it. You can write it down. But until it gets on the inside of you and mixes with your heart and with faith, it doesn't come alive. It doesn't release its power. Brothers and sisters, we need to know the Word of God. We need to get to where we take it. And I can promise you that whatever your problem is tonight, there's an answer in the Word for it. All you got to do is go to the Word. Find the thing that addresses your situation. Mix it with faith and believe it with all of your heart and boom, supernatural power is released. Creative power that created the universe. Certainly that's enough to handle your hangnail, your headache, your little backache. We just don't understand how powerful this is. I saw a thing recently about the persecution just prior to the King James Bible being translated, and about William Tyndale and how he was taken and killed. I forget all of the details. Was he burned at the stake? He was burned at the stake here in England. And did you know it was just 20 years later that, that uh, King James ordered the translation of the King James Bible? And it was based primarily on William Tyndale's work. And did you know people died to put this Bible in your hand because they understood the power of the Word. And today, I bet you every person in here has a Bible. And yet, if this is a typical group, again, you're the fanatics. This may not be typical, but if you're typical, the vast majority of you go days without ever studying the Word, without meditating in it. And yet people gave their life to deliver this to you. The Lord inspired people. This is the greatest gift that God has ever given man. The revelation of His nature. The knowledge of Him. Second Second Peter chapter 1 verse 4. The knowledge gave us these exceeding great and precious promises. This is the greatest gift that God ever gave mankind outside of Jesus. But this is the record and the revelation of all of this. And most of us have it and don't even use it. 
That speaks volumes about how we do not believe in the power of the Word. I'm trying to share with you to believe this Word, to understand the power of faith-filled words. And if you can believe this, if you could approach what that centurion did, you speak the Word only. I don't have to feel something. I don't have to see something. I don't have to have somebody prophesy to me. I don't have to have three confirmations. I just believe the Word. You get that place, and I guarantee you, you'll start seeing miraculous results in your life. You'll start being above only and not beneath, the head and not the tail. This is how the kingdom works. Things I'm saying ought to be things that are understood by every person in the body of Christ. And yet the average Christian, this is just off the charts. It's not even in the same book. It's like it's another book. It's not a different page or chapter. It's a different book. Most people don't even think this way. This is the way that Christians ought to think. And again, some of you think I'm weird, but I think I'm normal. Or getting normal. Amen. I'm more normal than I used to be. I encourage you to become weird. Amen. I encourage you to start believing these things. And if you'll do this, it'll work for you. You know, there's no reason that God chose me. I don't have any natural talents or abilities. I'm a hick from Texas. I, it took me probably ten years to get to where I could even tolerate to hear a tape of myself because I have such a weird voice. I've had people say, I thought you were Gomer Pyle. Most of you probably don't know who Gomer Pyle is. but I've had jokes made about me and stuff. You know, God didn't choose me.